Hello, and welcome to Micrographia, an exploration of everyday items at the micro and nano scale. Even the most mundane or forgettable subjects can become endlessly beautiful when viewed at the microscopic level. The crystalline symmetry of common table salt or the organically alien landscape of an oak leaf all show remarkable beauty when viewed at a high enough magnification to see the details that are normally obscured by the inferior instrument that is our eyes. The subject of today, the common fruit fly, is no different. It may be a nuisance, but even a nuisance can be beautiful in their own light. Drosophila melanogaster, the common fruit fly, is found nearly everywhere on Earth. It is all but guaranteed that each and every one of you watching this video has swatted at a fruit fly at some point in your life, regardless of where you call home. They are attracted to ripening fruit, garbage bins, and compost piles, making them natural, if unwanted, roommates to humanity. And while you might see Drosophila descending upon that overripe banana that you forgot in the corner of your kitchen, they're not actually eating the fruit itself. Drosophila feed on yeast cells, which are growing in abundance on top of that fruit. Yeast, in turn, grows nearly everywhere in the world. It's on every surface, on your face, your hands, inside your gut microbiome, on wild fruits and vegetables, even deep in the ocean. And thus, we find Drosophila everywhere yeast are present, perhaps with an exception of the ocean. And while they may be a nuisance in your kitchen, Drosophila have become a favorite tool of biologists. Known as a model organism, fruit flies are perfect tools to study evolution and genetics. Simple and cheap to maintain, they grow in large numbers and are tolerant of sometimes imperfect care of busy graduate students. Research into fruit fly genetics has paved the way to huge advancements in our understanding of human genetics and are truly invaluable to modern research. But this was not always the case. First introduced as a model organism in the early 1900s, fruit flies were looked down upon by most scientists. They had no prestige. They were not domesticated or bred by amateurs like other popular organisms of the day. And their affinity towards garbage heaps offended the sensibilities of scholars. They were often relegated towards less important or side experiments or used as a teaching tool for the undergraduates. This has, of course, changed over time, and Drosophila are now one of the most important model organisms that we study. But I think that's enough of history for now. Let's look at the fruit fly in a little more detail. Over 40% of the surface of a fruit fly is taken up by its eyes, so we'll start there. Each compound eye is composed of about 750 smaller hexagonal subunits called omatidia. Each omatidium has a large corneal lens on the top, which helps focus light onto photoreceptor cells underneath. Compared to your eyes, fruit flies have pretty poor spatial resolution. They just can't see things all that well. But the compound eye gives a huge field of view and can react very quickly to changes in light intensity. These are both important properties when you're a tiny flying snack for larger predators. In between each segment is an ocular hair. It's believed that these operate similar to mammalian eyelashes. They deflect air currents and create a pocket of stagnant air just above the surface of the eye, which helps prevent dust and particles from getting stuck. When half your body is literally an eyeball, it's important to keep them clean. Drosophila also have another organ that can sense light. These are called ocelli, and a fruit fly has three arranged in a triangle on the top of their forehead. Unlike the main compound eye, these have a single giant corneal lens with many photoreceptors inside. Spatial resolution, however, is even worse than the compound eye, but they are much more sensitive to changes in light. And because of their close physical proximity to the fly's brain, means response time is very fast to these photoreceptors. These organs help assist in tracking the sky and the horizon, which helps the fly, well, fly better. It also helps estimate day-night cycles so that the fly can keep track of time. 
There are many interesting features on the fruit fly. It's easy to lose track of time just looking at all the little details, browsing around. But I personally became entranced with their feet. Yes, yes, their feet, I know. But I mean, just look at it. Doesn't it look like something out of science fiction? How cool is that? Drosophila feet are composed of two to three curved claws, and these claws are used to climb relatively rough surfaces, like the side of a piece of fruit. In between the claws are pads known as pavilli, and these pavilli pads sprout tubular fronds known as setae, which are used to help climb smooth surfaces like glass. These fine hairs secrete a sticky adhesive, which allows Drosophila to land on, well, just about anything, and walk anywhere they wish to go, even upside down on the ceiling. The fine hairs also are attracted naturally to the surface through van der Waals forces, just like geckos, and use a similar mechanism to hold on to smooth surfaces. What I love about these micrographs is that the closer you look, the more questions arise. Did you notice those small spheres and blobs attached to the claws earlier? While it's difficult to know exactly what these are, they're most likely yeast cells, or in some cases, plant pollen. As I mentioned before, Drosophila feed on yeast and climb around surfaces that are covered in yeast, so it's not unreasonable to expect that some of those yeast cells would hitch a ride on the fly itself. We can see various locations around the fly that likely contain yeast cells tucked away behind joints and around hair follicles. This particular specimen has a large mat-like biofilm on its back. This is probably just congealed apple juice from the trap that was used to collect the fly, and we can see there's a whole host of yeast cells going for a ride on this biofilm. But despite the stereotypes, flies are actually pretty clean animals, constantly grooming themselves to remain free of dirt crime and freeloaders like this yeast. Under normal circumstances, the fly likely would have cleaned this biofilm off in pretty short order. I'm not an expert in Drosophila anatomy, but that doesn't prevent me or you from looking at these micrographs and appreciating the complexity and surprising beauty of the organism. I hope this has been an interesting look into the microscale features of a creature that everyone has seen frequently, but one that few rarely look at very closely. It might still be a nuisance in your kitchen, but perhaps the next time you are shooing them away from that ripe mango, you'll appreciate the beauty that is packed into such a tiny little insect. If you enjoyed this look at the microscopic world, please consider subscribing or sharing the video with a friend. If you have suggestions for future subjects to investigate, let me know in the comments down below. Hopefully there are not too many glaring mistakes, but if you happen to be a Drosophila expert, please feel free to leave corrections in the comments and I'll compile them into an addendum. And as always, thanks for watching.